Good morning, everybody, and um, welcome. Uh, my name is Anastasia Melona, and I'm the head of research at CIPSI. Um, I will also be chairing this webinar and the Q&A um, session afterwards. Uh, thank you for attending today's webinar, which is one of the series Grow Your Knowledge webinars organized by CIPSI. Um, this webinar will present the results of a three-year research project, which was co-funded by BRE Trust and CIPSI Research Fund. Um, our speaker is Dr. Paul Littlefair, who is jointly managed the, um, this project. Paul leads the lighting team at BRE, which is the UK's independent building research organization. He has 40 years experience in lighting. Um, the title of his PhD thesis was Daylighting Design and Energy Conservation. He has published over 100 books and papers on lighting and related issues, including co-authoring the, um, the recent BRE review on lighting and health. Um, Paul, over to you. Thank you, Anastasia, and good morning, everybody. And um, welcome to our webinar on circadian lighting for health and well-being. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my next slide. It worked. <laughs> it worked a moment ago. Paul, try sorry. the um, arrow. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it, sorry, it's worked. I don't know. My computer suddenly, suddenly has, stopped working. It has worked. Yeah, it has. So, uh, yeah, so uh, welcome everybody again. Sorry about that. Our project um, started off from an earlier project which we did on lighting and health. This was a, a review project, and we, we published this document here called Lighting and Health. And we looked at all sorts of aspects of lighting and health, um, apart from the very obvious ones like lighting falling on people's heads and electrocuting people and setting fire to things. But we, we looked at all the, the other lighting related issues. And this could be things like um, because the lighting's, uh, there's not enough lighting or it's too glaring and you can't see hazards. We looked at glare and uh, its effects on headaches and um, sore eyes, flicker, again causing headaches and eye strain and things like, even things like epilepsy. We looked at the uh, possible uh, eye damage and skin damage from lighting and we also looked at things like mercury uh, from fluorescent tubes and whether LEDs had toxic chemicals in, which they, they don't by and large. But one of the things that really came across from our lighting and health project was about circadian rhythms. Our bodies have circadian rhythms which control our activities during the day. And we can see in the, um, the picture to the right, we can see all the different things that it affects. So, so obviously sleep, sleeping during the night, but also even things like body temperature and blood pressure, they all are affected by our body's circadian rhythms. And also uh, peak performance. So, so it, it's, I say, the highest alertness is at 10 o'clock. So it's downhill from, from now on. And these circadian rhythms are mediated by light Light, especially blue light, sends signals to, to the brain which control these circadian rhythms. Light suppresses melatonin, which is a key hormone in circadian rhythms. It's a hormone that makes us sleepy. And so if you're exposed to light at night, that can cause lack of sleep. And conversely, exposure to light during the day helps to regulate our daily rhythms of sleep and alertness. Lack of light can lead to free running rhythms, sometimes with wakefulness at light and sleepiness during the day. Blind people often have problems with this because often their, their eyes are not sending the right signals to, to the brain. And so that means that they can end up with their circadian rhythms out of sync 
with the actual uh, daytime so so they can feel sleepy during the day and alert at night. Scientists have only recently discovered how this is done. They discovered special cells in the retina, uh, which, as well as the rod and cone cells, which allow normal sight, there are these special cells called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, or IPRGCs for short. These produce a photopigment called mel melanopsin, which sends signals to the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain, which drives the body's circadian clocks. And apparently each, each of the cells in our body has its own little clock, which is synchronized by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The cells in the retina, the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, are especially sensitive to blue light at 460 to 480 nanometer wavelengths. And we'll talk a bit more about that later on, the spectral sensitivity. Now, normally, if you're exposed to daylight, this helps to modify your circadian rhythms. It provides bright light during the day, but it's not always available in workplaces and, and sometimes in homes. Electric circadian lighting is now widely promoted with brighter, bluer light during the day, with the aim of synchronizing circadian rhythms and promoting alertness. And the lighting is supposed to become dimmer and redder towards the evening when it's time to relax. As Anastasia has explained, the BRE Trust and SIBSI have um, been uh, funding this project to investigate circadian lighting and obtain occupant reactions to a real installation. And our project included a workshop attended by experts in the field, a literature review, an ex experimental monitoring of a real office with circadian lighting in it, and producing guidance. I ought to, at this stage, thank my uh, co-author and colleague, Cosmin Ticlianu. Unfortunately, Cosmin can't be with us today, but he did he did lots of the, the work involved in this. So he did uh, the literature review and uh, virtually all of the experimental monitoring. So, so thank you very much, Cosmin, for that. And a lot of the slides which I'll be showing are, are diagrams which Cosmin produced. So first of all, I want to talk about the, the findings of our literature review. And this is available on SIBSI's website in their knowledge portal. And there's a reference here. I'll, I'll leave at the end of the, uh, the talk, I'll, I'll leave um, some of these references up so you don't have to write them down now. So first of all, in the literature review, we looked at daylight. As I've said, daylight gives high levels of blue enriched light, which are ideal for modulating circadian rhythms, resulting in improved health and mood. There have been several studies of the healing effects of daylight in hospitals. So less, uh, they've resulted, daylight resulted in less pain medication, less stress, shorter length of stay in hospital, lower mortality rates in heart units, and quicker recovery in other types of wards. Outside hospitals, in, in offices, exposure to high levels of daylight within buildings can lead to increased sleep quantity and quality. And there's been this study in Chicago, which found quite a surprising finding that workers in offices with windows slept for 46 minutes per, per night more during the working week than uh, similar workers without windows. So that's quite a substantial difference to, to people's sleep patterns. And there have been studies in schools as well. Children in win windowless schools have been shown to have lower levels of cortisol, which is another hormone that's uh, modulated by, by light. And uh, low levels of cortisol reduce the body's resistance to infection and the ability to concentrate or cooperate. So can electric lighting do the same thing? Well, in principle, 
exposure to bright electric light at the correct times of day may have similar effects. However, it's possible that electric lighting levels may be too low during the day and too high during the evening or at night, and the light spectrum may not be right. It's certainly true that the increasing use of electric light has paralleled a rise in sleep deficiency. Whether that's causative or not, we don't know, but, but it's something that the more, more electric light in more advanced societies has resulted in um, not resulted in, but been accompanied by a rise in sleep deficiency. And it's also true that exposure to the wrong light, particularly at night, is likely to disrupt the circadian system. So then we looked at specific studies. First of all, at the um, studies that just looked at providing higher illuminances and higher what are called correlated colour temperatures. The colour of lighting is, um, is often described by the correlated colour temperature. And that the higher that is, basically the bluer the light is. So, so for example, um, people who've looked at uh, blue enriched lighting at around 6,500K 6, colour temperature and high levels of that, that lighting have shown improvements in academic performance, increased subjective alertness, uh, 2,500 lux, and, um, and under 17,000 K colour temperature, which is really, really bluish, increased sleep quality and duration, alertness and performance. And these were under very high levels of very blue lighting. There have also been a, a few studies, not so many studies, on variable lighting conditions. Um, and the, the two studies I've got here are, are based in, in Holland by uh, Smulders and uh, his team. And they found that the baseline, just um, having a baseline exposure of just 200 lux under 4000K color temperature, so that's normal white office lighting. And then replacing that by a thousand lux made people more alert and energetic and with better cognitive performance. So that's just in the lab giving people a zap of lighting. They also did uh, a longer term study for three weeks looking at the difference between static lighting, 500 lux at warm white color temperature, and then dynamic lighting, which introduced um, whiter lighting, not really blue light, and slightly higher illuminances. So not all that much difference in terms of illuminance. And they found no differences on self-reported measures of well-being and performance, including sleep quality. But people did like to have the dynamic lighting. There have been studies done on use of preference where people were given uh, dimmer switches and um, and in one ca in some cases uh, um, switches to operate the the color of the lighting as well and um, and the two studies at the top found that that people did tend to prefer higher light levels and they also preferred some sort of uh, daylight cycle with with um, cool white lighting uh, during the day when there was uh, a lot of daylight available. I have to say that both of these studies were done by lighting companies. And when BRE did a study in, a, um, in an office which already had uh, dimmer, dimmer switches that occupants could control, they tended to, to go for much lower illuminances. So sometimes um, typically around 200 lux or so. And we're not absolutely sure why that is. We think possibly one thing might be that if you give people a range, so if you give people, say, a range from 100 to 500 lux, then they tend to, to go for the middle of that range, so maybe about two to 300 lux. Whereas if you give people a range from up to 2,000 lux, then they might go for the middle of that range, which is about 1,000 lux. 
And it's true that high luminance levels can be associated with glare as well. So that's something that you need to, to take into account because you don't want to be zapping people with uh, very high levels of light and then causing problems with glare and making it hard for them to work. The, the other effects are light at night, and, and this affects people particularly who are doing shift working. Light at night in the blue wavelength range is likely to be particularly disruptive to the circadian rhythm. And shift working has been linked to a range of disorders, including lack of sleep, suppression of melatonin, which may re result in increased risk of cancer, heart disease and digestive illness. It's possible for employers to take measures which either limit the amount of shift work or night work, or alternatively make, uh, make things easier for people to retain their circadian rhythms. So one uh, option is to rotate shifts quickly on uh, say a one to two day basis with less light at night to stop disrupting people's circadian rhythms. Alternatively, you can um, keep people on the night shift say for long periods of time and, and provide bright light at night. And in those situations, their circadian rhythm should, should shift to being um, basically alert during the night. Uh, the problem is often then if they go on holiday or if they're um, up and about at the weekend, then that can disrupt their circadian rhythms back again. So, so there, there isn't really an optimal solution. So the conclusions of our literature review, electric lighting can in principle help maintain people's circadian rhythms. Building occupants tend to prefer the dynamic nature of daylight as opposed to constant illumination conditions provided by traditional electric lighting. It's possible that variable lighting with higher illuminances and blue enriched light at the right time of day could help increase alertness, performance and productivity by synchronizing the body's circadian rhythms. But more research-based evidence is required to identify adequate lighting conditions uh, for entraining circadian rhythms. So the next stage of our project was this office study. But before I talk about that, I just wanted to, to measure, mention how so the circadian effects of lighting are measured. And in our literature review, we've talked about a number of different metrics. There are different metrics that people are using. And, but what we're using in today's presentation is, because I guess it's the easiest to understand, is a thing called equivalent melanopic lux. So normal lux, the, the unit of light falling on the surface, is weighted by the visual sensors in the eye. It's weighted by the spectral sensitivity of those visual receptors. Equivalent melanopic lux is weighted by the spectral sensitivity of the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that help to control circadian rhythms. So it's worked out on the same basis, but using a different spectral sensitivity. It's more sensitive to blue light. There have been recommendations for equivalent melanopic lux in the WELL building standard, which many of you will be familiar with. It recommends at least 150 equivalent melanopic lux measured vertically at eye height for four hours in the morning. For maximum credits, it recommends 240 equivalent melanopic lux. There's, slightly diff there's different recommendations for daylit spaces. 150 equivalent melanopic lux, just so you've got an idea, usually equals more but what we call photopic lux, the, lux, the normal lux that's worked out on the visual receptors in the eye. So if we've got, say, uh, 
one white fluorescent lighting, 150 equivalent melanopic lux is roughly equal to 333 lux at uh, for one white fluorescent lighting. If we've got, say, white LEDs at 4000K, it's roughly equal to 198 lux. Depends slightly on the spectrum of the LEDs. But it's important to realize as well that these are all vertical illuminances at the light at the eyes level. And typically, if you've got sort of normal office lighting with uh, down lights, then you'd be looking at a horizontal illuminance of around uh, 300 to 500 lux. Um, sorry, you've been so you'd be looking at um, horizontal lux, which is normally about twice what the what the vertical illuminance at the eye is. So, so say if we've got um, one white fluorescent lighting, we want 150 equivalent melanopic lux, 333 lux at the eye. You'd be looking at around six to seven hundred lux on the horizontal plane. So perhaps a bit more than what you'd normally get. So to talk about our experimental setup, uh, we had a lot of trouble finding a, a suitable office to do this in, uh, but in the end, um, a university kindly offered their basement office. We wanted an office with very little daylight and we, we got one. It had, uh, it had very little daylight. It had, when, um, when we first started doing the study, it had uh, constant fluorescent light. And by constant, I mean constant in terms of time. It was actually quite non-uniform because some people have been complaining about the lighting and um, and some of the luminaires have been switched off in areas where people were complaining that the lighting was too bright. And the office, as part of the study, the office was refitted with variable LED lighting, which could vary both in color and also in intensity or illuminance. What we have here is the equivalent melanopic lux, um, which is on the on the uh, y-axis in our little graph here. And we've plotted that against time of day. So we started off at quite low levels of equivalent melanopic lux, around 100. And then we whacked it up in the morning to around uh, 220 EML, and then uh, back down again in the afternoon, and then towards the end of the day, right down to around 70 equivalent melanopic lux. Most of the change in equivalent melanopic lux was due to changing the color of the lighting. So what we wanted to do was to ensure that people had enough light to work by at all times. And so the average illuminance on the horizontal plane didn't go below um, 350 lux. So the findings from, from this phase one. So we're comparing condition two, which is a condition with variable LED lighting against condition one which is the condition with um, just uh, constant fluorescent lighting. And there are 23 people who did subjective assessments of the test. And they also did little tests to assess their reaction time and concentration. And they also answered questionnaires about how, how they uh, slept as well. With the LED system, we found that people felt more subjectively alert, both in the afternoon and averaged across the day. And in some of the reaction time tests, um, they performed better in the morning and across the day. So it sounded like the circadian lighting was actually doing something, it was actually uh, helping people. But then when we drilled down into the data, we found that it wasn't quite as clear cut as all that. If you look at the graph, what we've done here is we've we've plotted uh, the subjective alertness findings. So we've plotted people's average scores for 
circadian alert, subjective alertness. And, um, and so the, the values which are, that's on the y-axis, so the values which are above the horizontal x-axis, that's where people felt more alert. And there's, there were a few people who felt less alert. But you can, you can see that most people felt more alert. But what we've done here is we've plotted this against the relative difference in the equivalent melanopic lux that people were exposed to. So people at the far end were exposed to much more melanopic lux with, uh, with the new lighting. People at the left-hand end were actually exposed to less equivalent melanopic lux. And this was a function of where they were sitting in the space because some of, partly it was because some of the electric lighting had been turned off under condition one because people were complaining it was too bright. But also the, the lighting had a, it had a different um, spatial distribution anyway. So it had, um, so some people were getting more light and some people were getting slightly less light. And when we looked at the findings, the reported increase in subjective alertness did not vary significantly with how much extra lighting people had got, or even whether they got extra lighting at all. So people who got extra equivalent melanopic lux, in general, by and large, reported better subjective alertness, but so too did the people who got less equivalent melanopic lux than they had before. And we found that there was no statistically significant correlation between the increases in circadian weighting lighting metrics and the variation in subjective alertness or reaction time. And we also did studies of sleep patterns as well. And 12 of the participants agreed to wear a little device called an active watch, which monitored their activity and sleep patterns. But there were negligible differences in sleep metrics under the two different lighting conditions. And, and they, were, it, they were really astonishingly similar. So the, uh, the sleep times were virtually the same to the nearest minute on average. So we, we then went back to the office for next, for next autumn. So we were doing these studies in um, spring and autumn uh, before the clocks went back and, and after they went, sorry, before the clocks went forward and after they went back again. And the, the idea being to, to make sure that uh, people weren't exposed to too much light outside of the workplace. And uh, we also didn't want to do it in the middle of winter because we wanted to avoid Christmas, which could possibly affect people's circadian rhythms. For phase two, what, what happened, there was one bit, uh, major change in the office, which is uh, in the old office, um, or in phase one, people had white desks. And one of the things that people were complaining about was that the light was too bright and reflecting light off their white desks. And this limited the amount of light that was provided under the old lighting system because people wanted some of it turned off, but also it limited the amount of light that we could give them under the new lighting system. During the summer, the university replaced the white desks with wooden effect ones, and this allowed us to increase the LED lighting to give higher equivalent melanopic lux. Because we thought that maybe under phase two, sorry, maybe under condition two, they didn't have enough, enough light. So we thought we'll whack it right up. And so we've got really quite high equivalent melanopic luxes. It goes from uh, 180 equivalent to up to nearly 350 equivalent melanopic lux. These are all average values. And then down to about 280 in the afternoon, still quite high. And um, 
finally back down to around 130 at the end of the day. The, again, the photopic lux uh, varied less than this. The mean horizontal illuminances, photopic lux, uh, so this is a visual lux that you, you normally use, varied from 600 lux at the beginning of the day to around 1120 lux in late morning, and then back down to around 670 lux at the end of the day. So quite high lighting levels, but, uh, but varying um, equivalent melanopic lux. And we then compared that with a fourth condition, which was it was using the LED lighting. So they still had the new lighting, but it was operated at a constant level. So we just kept it the same the whole time during condition four. And that was a mean of 149 equivalent uh, melanopic lux. So quite a low level of equivalent melanopic lux. And then what we found was that there was no significant differences at all in the average scores for subjective alertness or um, things like uh, reaction time tests or concentration between those two conditions. And the people who, who wore the, uh, the active watch devices, their, their sleep patterns were, were more or less the same under the two different uh, conditions. So if we look at the, uh, the four different conditions overall, it seemed like it wasn't really anything to do with, with how much equivalent melanopic lux people had in the range that we gave them. It was more, perhaps the increase in subjective alertness was, was more to do with them um, having nice new lighting and also um, having some of the problems that the old lighting caused being solved. So it's still not clear how much circadian lighting people actually need. Maybe our installation provided too little light, both before and after, even though we did actually give them quite a lot of equivalent melanopic lux up to around 350, which is well above what's in the well standard. Or maybe our installation gave them more than enough light before and after. So maybe even just um, uh, 300, 400 lux horizontal of normal electric light is enough to modulate circadian rhythms. Or maybe the participants got enough light by going outdoors because we couldn't actually imprison them in the office the whole time. We did do the studies um, during, during times of year when we thought that um, they wouldn't actually get so much light outside. But it turned out that a few of them did go outside at lunchtime. And of course, they, they sometimes went outside to, to other buildings for work purposes. So further research is required for how much circadian lighting people actually require and until then, recommendations in documents like the Well Standard, and um, there's a, a German standard on lighting, on circadian lighting, those need to be viewed with caution because it's not at all clear how much light people actually need to modulate their circadian rhythms. However, we did find out some other useful things from the, the study. We had important findings on controls. This was a this office was actually the uh, the second office that we uh, tried to do the study in. But in the first one, the controls uh, didn't work properly. They never worked properly. They had um, quite a sophisticated wireless control system, which um, didn't actually work as as programmed. And in the end, the uh, the office owners uh, thought that. Um, they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't actually have the circadian lighting, they just have constant lighting because it couldn't be controlled properly. Uh, I have to say this was not the, uh, the lighting company that actually installed the, uh, the system that we looked at in this university office. 
so it's um, it's important to have effective controls. It's also important to vary the light slowly so that it doesn't uh, suddenly go from from one condition to another. It's important if you're actually installing circadian lighting um, to explain to users what's happening and the purpose of varying the lighting. Now that's quite difficult to do with if you're doing an experiment. So you don't really say want to say if you're doing an experiment, you don't want to say, oh, well, we, we're going to put circadian lighting in so you'll feel more alert and healthy. But if you're actually just installing it in your office, you might want to say, yeah, you'll all feel more alert and healthy in the hope that people actually will. The other thing that we've been saying for we've been banging on for ages about controls is that people vary in their preferences for lighting. And we always recommend to offer people in spaces like office to offer people individual control over their own lighting. Uh, but it's true that this can negate the circadian effects, and I'm not sure what the best way around this is. Uh, lesson three is to always to have a good visual environment. And this means having a good visual environment, both when the lighting is at peak output, perhaps in the, the morning when you're trying to modulate people's circadian rhythms, and also towards the end of the day when you're having much dimmer lighting. So you need to change the color of the lighting as well as the intensity. You need a balanced visual environment to avoid over bright surfaces. So the, so the white desks in this office didn't really work under the, uh, the brighter levels of lighting. You need to use reflected light to avoid high contrasts and gloom, to choose low glare luminaires with no flicker. So just uh, following the normal rules about having a good visual environment. One of the problems, particularly in the good visual environment, is ensuring people have enough light late on. Because they still need enough light to work by, but you don't want too much light late on to alter your circadian rhythms. And so the, the typical solution is to use one white light with a typical color temperature around 2,700 Kelvin, which is typically what you get from a tungsten lamp. And that with 300 lux horizontal illuminance, that's photopic, that gives typically 60 equivalent melanopic lux at the eye. The scope to reduce this further in the future with a tailored spectrum. One of the problems with uh, the usual LEDs which you have at the moment is that they, they do have a, a slight peak at the blue end. And, and in this spectral graph, you can see with the two, even with the 2,700 Kelvin LED, you've got a little peak, that's the orange curve, you've got a little peak at around 450 nanometers, which is still in this range where you can get melanopic response. In future, it might be possible to reduce this further by having a tailored spectrum. So for example, by having uh, violet LEDs, and one manufacturer is now bringing out violet LEDs, which have a, a peak uh, um, at lower wavelengths, which, um, which are, are more outside of this melanopic response range. One of the most uh, things that surprised us, and, and which is really important for studies of circadian lighting, is that even with uh, so-called uniform lighting, so a standard array of luminaires, vertical illuminances can vary widely over the space, depending which way people are facing. So if somebody's facing a wall, they're going to get much less light than somebody facing into, say, the body of the office. And what we found that was that under condition two, under the peak lighting, so so it's the same horizontal lux, the, the light falling on the eyes varied in equivalent melanopic lux by a factor of around three in the same space at the same time, just depending which way people were facing. And so in circadian lighting, it's very difficult to ensure a consistent dose of light for, for the occupants. Some people are going to get more, some people are going to get less, and that's a difficult thing to, to allow for. 
And the final lesson is from our study was that people vary. And we found this in the literature review. We found that circadian clocks run differently between individuals. And there are some people, early chronotypes, who, who get up and go to bed early. And there are others, late chronotypes, who tend to get up late and go to bed late. I guess I've been both. I've been, when I was a, a teenager, I found it very hard to get up. But now I get up really early in the morning. For late chronotypes, bright light in the morning may help to reset circadian rhythms. However, this will be less beneficial for early chronotypes. And the people's, people's lifestyle also affects the light that they receive outside the workplace, especially if they go outside at lunchtime. That's always a good idea to maintain your circadian rhythms. Just one, as we're, as we're all under perhaps... Um, many of us under abnormal conditions. I just wanted to, to say a little bit about uh, working at home because we're having to adjust to a whole new routine, but these principles about exposure to light also apply at home during lockdown. It's best to work in a daylit room where possible and uh, to position screens perpendicular to the windows to re reduce glare so you're not either facing the window directly or having it reflected in your screen. It's good to go outside for your daily exercise in the morning or at lunchtime, and to avoid bright lighting and screen use late in the evening. It's good to keep in a routine, even if you're on furlough and you're not actually working um, at your normal job. There's a US uh, lighting research center video at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, that's the Lighting Research Centre, uh, called Sleep Better and Feel Better While Working From Home. And it's quite a short video, but it's quite entertaining. So you might want to, to look that up. So in conclusion then, lighting can influence circadian rhythms. And circadian lighting has been marketed. It's dynamic lighting that's brighter and bluer during the daytime and dimmer and redder in the evening with the aim of aiding relaxation. But when we did a study in an office space, it gave inconclusive results. We found that there wasn't really a difference in people's sub subjective alertness or reaction time or even sleep pattern, depending on how much light that they had. And partly this could be due to individual differences. Individuals vary in how much light they receive, both in the workplace, even when they're sitting at their desk, it depends which way they're facing, and also outside. And also individuals have different circadian cycles. If dynamic lighting is being installed, then it needs to meet people's visual needs, both at peak levels and also at minimum levels. And it's important that controls work reliably. So that was all I was going to say, just to, to say that if you want to look at some of the results of our study, then they're available on the BRE and SIBC websites. There's a, uh, a final report which gives, uh, oops, sorry, I've touched my mouse by mistake, which gives a uh, report on um, all the findings from the project. There's a literature review, um, which is also available. Both of these are on the, the SIBC knowledge portal. There's a published article, Evaluating Dynamic Lighting, which was in the uh, SIBC journal June 2019. We've done a BRE information paper called Lighting for Circadian Rhythms, which is available from BRE Trust's website. And finally, we've done a, uh, our BRE Trust report on lighting and health, which I mentioned earlier. That's, um, that, that's the only one that's a price publication, and you can get it from BRE's web-based bookshop, which also has all our other uh, lighting publications and, and other publications as well. So that's all I was going to say. And... Uh, I'll hand back to Anastasia for the questions. I'll leave this slide up so you can you can copy down some of these details.
Thank you, Paul. That was really interesting and very clear presentation. Um, uh, just a couple of things that came up during the uh, question during the presentation. The um, uh, the webinar presentation and recording will be available um, to everyone that attended the uh, well, it will be available to everybody, but specifically for those that attended the webinar, there will be an email tomorrow that will include a link, um, also a CPD certificate and a survey where you can add your comments. Um, if you, by the end of this uh, Q&A session, you still have questions, um, you can include them either in your survey or you can still uh, email email them to technical at cipsi.org. Um, also to say that the ports on the knowledge portal are available to everybody for free. Um, I'm going to go through some of the questions now. We don't have a lot of time, but hopefully we can answer some of them. Um, do circadian rhythms alter between sexes, body mass and ethnic background? Um. That's a good question. I'm not I'm not aware of, of any particular differences. So um, yeah, I'm, I don't think there are uh, particularly large differences uh, in circadian rhythms between different different characteristics of people. It's it's something that everybody has. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next one is quite interesting, at least to me, and it comes up quite often. Uh, how to balance correctly the risk of overheating and too much of um, thermal solar gain through obviously through the windows. Um, if if I can answer that before Paul, um, I would say that when you're designing your your windows, you need to look at it holistically. So um, balance the the size of the window in the daylight, but um, not just applying it um, <clears throat> without considering the, the thermal gains. Um, Paul, I don't know if you would like to add something. Uh, yes, I, I'm really pleased this question has been asked because mm. it gives me a chance to advertise one of my other books, which is called Solar Shading of Buildings. And there are mm -hmm. all sorts of ways in which you can uh, control uh, solar gain while admitting daylight. So you can have uh, uh, special glazing, which well, which is actually quite common now, which um, filters out the infrared rays while allowing daylight in, and and you can have uh, devices like overhangs or light shelves, which uh, cut out the, the high level sun while while allowing in uh, still allowing in appreciable daylight. So so there's all sorts of different things, and uh, yeah, and I've I've written a book on it, which is also available from our BRE bookshop. Um, okay, there is another question um, regarding lighting, the lighting of a room, how does it interact um, with the light from a computer screen? Okay, well, what we did when we were measuring the equivalent melanopic looks that people were getting, we did two measurements, or Cosmin, my, my colleague, did two measurements. He measured it with and without the screen on. So we looked at the difference and and it turns out that people actually get very little lighting from their computer screens, at least they did in the office that we were looking at. So it didn't, it didn't actually make a great deal of difference. It was just a few looks from the screen. And, and that begs the question of why uh, using a screen late at night can, can have such a big difference on people's uh, circadian rhythms as shown in other studies. And it may well be that it's it's not just um, it's not just the actual amount of light you're getting from the screen, but it's actually the content and the fact that you're using the screen and maybe you're working or socially interacting and then you end up um, thinking about those things during the night. So so yeah, so basically people don't get very much light from from screens. That's an interesting um because we always think that you know you shouldn't you shouldn't really look at the screen a few hours before you go to bed. Uh, well I think that's right, yeah. So mm. so I'd always recommend uh not looking at a screen for 
for an hour before bedtime yeah. but but it's not so much how much light you're getting off it it's more Quality. it's more about um what you're actually doing on that screen and whether I that's going to keep you awake or not i see um there is another question which um i guess it will be quite popular so um you know, a number of organizations have recently switched to LED lighting as a cheaper to use and longer lasting lighting option. Uh, do LED lights take this circadian rhythm uh, into account? Um, well, no, not automatically. If you So you can have constant LED lighting, which, um, you know, so you just switch it on at the beginning of the day and it just keeps the same level all day. And if you left it on all night, it would still be at the same level. So obviously that's not that's not varying. So it's not mm. not doing anything for your circadian rhythms, except that LEDs tend to have slightly more blue and rich light than uh, fluorescent lighting, and definitely compared to tungsten lighting at the same uh, color temperature. So if you have say white LED, it will uh, typically have um, around um, perhaps 20% more equivalent melanopic lux than fluorescent lighting at the same illuminance, the same visual illuminance. So, so LEDs ha do have slightly more blue in rich light, and so they would be expected to to have a slightly bigger impact on circadian rhythms, which is good if you're if you're exposed to that LED lighting during the day but it's not so good if you're exposed to it at night. Okay. Um, the following question is about measuring lux levels. Um, the question is, um, I have only measured lux levels horizontally, so we now be measuring vertically. Um, will lots of other factors, such as the core furniture, etc., interfere with the measurements? Um. So I guess the answers are maybe and yes. So <laughs> so maybe we should be measuring vertical illuminance. And and in the uh, the well standard, uh, it actually recommends that people measure the light that's reaching people's eyes at workstations. It's um, the, but the answer to the second question is doesn't it vary according to to lay out, it does. It does vary according to what sort of furniture you've got, and uh, particularly the way people are facing, as I said earlier, and whether you've got partitions in the office. And so, it's possible to, to say, design a lighting installation, which you normally do in an empty room, and then for for people, once you start furnishing that room and putting partitions in and putting posters up on the walls and stuff people actually get quite a different vertical illuminance at their eyes to to what was predicted and that's not the that's not the lighting designer's fault it's um it's just something that happens mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> um do you think that people are more alert in the morning simply because they have not yet done a day's work <laughs> that's um it's a fair question uh, right yeah, it's a it's a fair question, and um, it's uh, it's quite uh, it's quite possible that that that's true. I think it it does depend. We were talking about chronotypes, and I think it does depend slightly on chronotypes. So so I think at ten o'clock in the morning, I mean it says peak alert and say, but that's the general population, and I think there are, there are some people who probably feel really rubbish at ten o'clock in the morning. So. So it does uh, depend from person to person. And also some other things actually uh, improve during the afternoon. So, so things like muscle strength and coordination tend to improve in the, in the afternoon. So, so it's not, there's all sorts of different things which, uh, which vary in um, a circadian way and not always in the way that you'd expect. There is um, a, a similar question that um, is asking whether the study would be um, influenced by people drinking too much coffee or whether they're morning people or night people um, as well. So perhaps that's one of the, um, the things you mentioned about, you know, af afternoon, some people picking at afternoon in the afternoon. 
yes um mm -hmm. yeah um, i think it, it does make a it does mm -hmm. make a difference um, they, mm -hmm. sorry yeah it, it does make a difference um actually we uh, there was one study um which um which was done in in america and uh, it was done among students and they found that they uh, the biggest influence on uh, people's reactions to lighting was whether they'd taken drugs the night before. <laughs> so, uh, so all sorts of things can can actually affect you, uh, yeah. besides how much light you're receiving. Um, what sleep metrics uh, did you use in in the study? Oh gosh, uh, yeah. So we used uh, the main one we used was sleep duration. But we did use other other forms of um, there's all sorts of different sleep metrics and uh, Cosman did the analysis on this. <laughs> I'm trying to find out what he, he put, but um, we we did actually we did actually uh, look at a range of different sleep metrics and um, we're uh, we're going to um, we're hoping to write a uh, paper for lighting research and technology which uh, goes into a bit more detail about what the different metrics that we used uh, also paul we can follow up with some of the questions if um you know if if you want later as well um, okay the next question um were you expecting a more definitive result in relation to an upturn in subjective alertness um, I well, you're, you're never supposed to go into an experiment with expectations, but but I think we I think we were really, and and we sort of designed the experiment on in that way. So so what we were what we were hoping to do was hoping might happen was to um, was to find a difference in subjective alertness and to to have that quite closely result um correlated with the illuminance that people get at different times so so we could say well above this particular illuminance people that that's what has the effect on su subjective alertness and we didn't actually find that in the study um which was which was disappointing from a guidance point of view but it but it is what it is and we have to report what what resulted from the study um there is a similar question on alertness um how much do you think the element of change influenced people's perceived alertness? Um, as you mentioned, there were complaints about the previous constant fluorescent lighting. Uh, yes, yeah, so that could have been one factor. <clears throat> and and also, um, yeah, I mean, for, the, um, for some of the tests, the reaction time tests, you can also have a learning effect. So if people have spent two weeks doing the reaction time test, then they tend to get bigger, better at it. So that could have been a factor in that test. For su subjective alertness, it was more a, um, a, a question and a response thing. So there wasn't really a learning, a learning curve on that. But, um, but yeah, it could have been just, uh, you, you get this Hawthorne effect where if, if you've installed nice new lighting and it looks like you're actually um, taking an interest in people, then then that actually makes them more responsive and it makes them perhaps enjoy their work better and uh, and it could make them feel more subjectively alert. So so yes, that could be a factor. Hmm. Um, there is another question. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, regarding the um, the size of the room. It says um, the trial appears to be in an open plan area. Would you be willing to comment on how circadian lighting may affect a smaller room, a single occupant office or meeting room, perhaps? Okay, so um, so I I think in in terms of um, smaller rooms, it, it might be possible in a smaller room to to be able to tailor the lighting a bit more so that so so actually to design it specially so that people are getting a particular light level at their eyes so so one of the problems in the open plan space was that people in different parts of the space were getting different um, circadian lighting doses so it might be possible in a smaller space to to tailor that so that the occupant is getting the 
uh, the right level, whatever the right level is. Okay. Uh, um, I think in, a, in something like a meeting room, I don't think it, it has to be a room where people are there a lot of the time. So, so if you just pop into a meeting room, I don't know if that's going to to have mm. such an effect, unless it's something like a really well daily room that perhaps you go and have lunch in every day, that could have an effect. Okay. Well, um, this um, now is twelve o'clock, so I will uh, thank you, Paul, very much for your time for presenting and also answering all the questions. Um, thank you to Lucy that organized the webinar. Um, again, uh, an email will be sent to you uh, tomorrow so you can access, um, access it again and there are ways that you can uh, send your, your questions through the survey and through the technical at sipsi.org. Um, thank you all very much for participating. Uh, I hope you found it interesting um, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much.